Where you scream, don't watch that, watch this. And I'll dive down through this hair reflection. Hi, and welcome to Watch This. I'm CJ Johnson. Thank you for joining me. I'm joined by Adam Boys, and we are going to talk about HBO's Sharp Objects, which is screening in Australia on Foxtel through Showcase. Ma said she saw a ghost once. Now we've both seen seven of the eight episodes. We haven't seen the finale. So we're going to talk generally about the series and then we're going to issue a spoiler alert and then we're going to talk a little bit about, well, more spoilery stuff and we're both going to make our guesses as to where we think it's going because it is a mystery. It is essentially the unholy child of Gone Girl and Big Little Lies. This is my mm. hypothesis anyway, because Gillian Flynn wrote the novel of Gone Girl and Sharp Objects. She actually wrote Sharp Objects first, then Gone Girl became a hit, and then everyone started reading Sharp Objects as well. But this was her first novel. Jean-Marc Vallée directed all of Big Little Lies, and now Gillian Flynn is a creator of, and Jean-Marc Vallée has directed all of... <laughs> This one, Sharp Objects. So that's why I'm saying it feels a bit like Gone Girl, but it also feels a bit like Big Little Lies because especially the direction feels the same as Big Little Lies. Adam, did you see Big Little Lies? <clears throat> yes, I did, yeah, the whole thing. I think, I think the defining thing about this, and there's so much to talk about this, but to me the defining thing about it is this authorial voice of the director because Big Little Lies, because he did get to direct all six of them and because he has gotten to direct all eight of these, which mm -hmm. is so rare for television, mm -hmm. so rare, you get him doing a thing. You get him doing a style, which mm -hmm. is this lot of mysterious flashbacks, a lot of um, sometimes flash forwards, all this, this mystery and foreboding and he's got away with things. Naturalistic light, locations, letting scenes play out. He just has a style. He's got a, he's got a voice. And I think that's what sort of elevates this. What do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. We're in a transitional period of our TV. And um, at one point, everyone said TV was dead and they were dead wrong. TV's just evolved. And now we're seeing these peak TV shows with, like you said, that clear authorial voice across it. Um, it's beautiful and it is very much his style. However, I would say it does, and maybe it is just where the source material comes from, it does have a different feel to it as mm. well. It doesn't just feel like he's repeating his tricks. Mm. And those flashbacks you mentioned, I just love. I love the way he does that. Lynn Ramsey does the same thing in You Were Never Really Here. It's mm. these small snippets of things and then back to the protagonist in present time because when we think of things that make us unhappy, we try to think away from them as quick as possible. And sometimes they make us think of something else that's terrible and something else that's horrible, but then we're back to we're in our car driving. I just yeah. think that's that is so brilliant and beautiful. That's right what yeah. you say about when we think of things that make us unhappy because that's very much how the flashbacks are used here. They are very much used... Um, as sort of traumatic events yeah. and, and sad signifiers mm -hmm. for the lead character uh, played by Amy Adams, Camille. Now, I just wanted to mention one sort of wonky thing about his technique with those flashbacks. He does something very specific, which is he doesn't use the sound from the flashbacks. So he keeps the sound running in the present and just shows you the visual from the flashbacks. And it has this subconscious effect on you that is more unnerving than if it was a traditional flashback. 100%. You've nailed it. It's because we're in the we're in the persona of the protagonist. You yeah. are you are with them through everything. We're not you can't escape the memory and you can't escape life that's happening at you all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's really great. So Amy Adams who I have had a soft spot for ever since she, you know, came onto the scene. She plays Camille who is a woman from the town of Wingap, Missouri. Wingap has just less than 3,000 people, but she's moved to the Big Smoke, being St. Louis. She works for the St. Louis Dispatch, and at the beginning of the series, she is sent by the St. Louis Bis Dispatch back to her hometown of Wingap because there have been two... 
I think there was one, wasn't there? There was one murder and then one happens while she's there? Or am I, I making that No, up? I think there have been two. Yeah, okay. And then a third one. There have been two murders and of, of teenage girls. That's right. And a third girl has gone missing. And very quickly, that, that sort of, that girl shows up, essentially, mm. as a dead mm-hmm. girl. So she's been sent back to her hometown. Mm-hmm. And as is often the case with small hometowns where someone's left, you know, things are dark back at home. And she gets back involved with her family, played especially by Patricia Clarkson as her mother. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand, it's a murder mystery. And on the other hand, it's sort of a southern gothic. It is very much a southern Southern gothic, gothic for sure. Um, There's also that weird um, through line that she's been sent back by her editor as some sort of set up for therapy and that's revealed really early in the show his motivations to send her there was for her to deal with her own demons that we start to discover along the way as well uh but i i really i wonder what happens with that storyline because it it just peppers in but it doesn't quite yeah resolve in any great detail their relationship the first episode sets up a deeply troubled traumatized character uh she is a full alcoholic, and by full alcoholic, I mean she drinks vodka in the morning. Mm-hmm. And we repeatedly see her going to the store and buying vodka, like the moment the store opens, and the uh-huh. guy starts looking at her, you know, like that whole thing, and she's drinking it in the car. I mean, she's as alcoholic as it gets. She's drinking all day. She'll drink anywhere and pass out anywhere yeah. and wake up anywhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then we also get, so that's laid on the table. That's right there for us. Mm-hmm. Day drinker, morning drinker, bad problem. And then along with this, we get more subtle hints that are laid in and gradually come to the fore about possibilities of why this is happening, both in the long, deep past, family history, Mm -hmm. but also more recent trauma. Mm -hmm. And then about episode four, we get that trauma. So Mm -hmm. we get sort of two Mm -hmm. levels of trauma contributing to her current state of mind. Absolutely. Um, one thing I've noticed lately in landscape of, of television mainly is we, we're seeing this increase in uh, female-led stories. Uh, I don't know how it's going to continue, but as we start to tell genuine, and, and Big Little Lies is, is complicit to this, Impulse, uh, YouTube Red Show also does a similar thing, and uh, 13 Reasons Why uh, for all its controversy does the same thing. As we start to have female-led stories, I think we're getting this female experience and unfortunately what is sobering for audiences is female experience has had a lot of trauma associated with it and there's there's trauma in her story that she brushes off because it doesn't even compare to some of the other trauma she's experienced Mm. i'm really excited by this frontier hoping that it starts to really bring forward those stories and and we start to understand that female experience. Mm. Well, this, as I say, this book was written before Gone Girl and this is the one where I feel like Gillian Flynn put in everything. This is the whole kit and caboodle because she's not only alcoholic and has got all this trauma, there's also self-harm, cutting Mm. involved. Cutting is a thing that I didn't know about 10 years ago. And I guess through literature and television and a greater understanding of young adult issues, I've learnt about it. And I I would suggest that experience is not that different from many adults, possibly of my age. But there are so many tropes in this series that have been done since. I mean, the alcoholic woman in her sort of young middle age who goes back to her hometown, the entire sort of Scandinavian television industry right. runs on those fumes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cutting, uh, obviously alcoholism, dark family secrets, and also dead girls. I mean, everywhere is dead girls at the moment. This idea that, like, there are sort of three dead teen girls and, like, mm. we've got to stop the mystery before they're fourth. And yet for me, even though this is full of all those tropes, None of it feels annoying or tired. No. It, this, this feels like the good version of all of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't think it's about... This film doesn't seem to be about a detective stopping the killer before they kill again. No. It's not that kind of story. It's about her ha- being almost forced back to a place she doesn't want to be, she never wants to return, having to confront all these things she wants to bury while trying to do her job that she gets 
punished and criticised for at every turn by a small town community and by her mother, who's not only the matriarch of the home, is runs the town mm. and doesn't want her prying, doesn't want her asking questions. And so here she is trying to live her, I own my life, I'm an adult, but being relegated to childhood again by her, <laughs> by her mother. I'm not scared of them ghosts. Are you? Amy Adams, I'm guessing, is in her early 40s, playing a character here in her late 30s. That's kind of stated that she's mm. in her late 30s. And yet, when Patricia Clarkson pulls out the motherly stuff, she just becomes a nine-year-old emotionally in front of our eyes, and it's amazing. And what I love, a little, little beautiful thing that happened in this show that I've been wait waiting for. So when I saw It and you see Sophia Lillis, I just thought, oh, she's a young Amy Adams. Me too. She looks Me too. exactly like Amy yeah. Adams. I didn't think, um, what's her face, Jessica Chastain. I thought Amy Adams. Amy Adams. Yeah. And then I, I'm so happy to see that it didn't have to be that long. She a year later, she's friends. playing the young Amy Adams. It's, per it's perfect. It's almost like I got it too quick and I want it to happen for the rest of their lives. But it's just one beautiful moment in their history that I'm really proud it, to be a part of. It is a <laughs> Astonishing how much she looks like she should be Amy Adams. Perfect casting. Yeah, yeah. It's perfect casting. Yeah. Um, so Amy, you're right. As you said before, it's not like someone, you know, a detective going out to solve the mystery. In fact, this is a detective show without a detective. Like mm. because our lead investigator is blackout drunk sometimes by 11 a.m. and possibly is even unreliable in terms of a narrator of the mm. thing. And then our two real detectives, the local police chief and another detective who's been brought in from the big smoke because the local police chief really doesn't do murder very well. Right. They're both potential suspects. <laughs> so we don't actually have that traditional gumshoe to follow around. You're mm. right. Indeed, for me, the mystery, although I'm looking forward to finding out who done it, the mystery to me is by far the least important thing for me. For me, this is a show about for me, it's a show about an alcoholic, I think, the most. That's of, like, all the things that are going on. To me, that's what's most interesting. What about for you? Yeah, I, I, see, I see what you're saying about the alcoholism. I think the alcoholism doesn't exist without the past, doesn't exist without the, the family. And so it's, it's being at that point in her age, in her career, and kind of being f done with it all. Um, and then all those coping mechanisms and how they play into how she just gets by day to day. Mm. Um, My other thing I love about it, and Jean-Marc Vallée did this so well too with Big Little Lies, is just like that show was really about that coastal California community, yeah. he, this is so much about place. He just shoots this fictional town so well. We see one person of colour who kind of speaks in the, in well, uh, who's part of her her community, yeah, and then I I actually picked up on another shot. There was these this fight that going on between her and her mum, and then they walk away, and the frame just holds on a person of colour, this man just st sitting there who'd been watching the whole thing but had been ignored and and obscured, and then he's just there, and it was just a nice little subtle. Hey, in the south, we still don't care about yeah. black people. I mean, that's a broad thing. I can't say that. I'm not from the south. I don't know, but yeah. but it was an. I felt like it was a deliberate hold on that character. Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely, because the, the racial attitudes in this town are very fucked up and old-fashioned and weird and strange, um, to the point where we discover, uh, certainly a bit later, that there is a whole underclass of people who live 20 clicks away and actually have their own bar. That's you right. You know, they have their whole alternate <clears throat> society because they are the workers at the factory. This is old money hog farming. They are workers at the hog farm that these people all live off in nice houses with nice dresses. I love um, one of the opening lines when she's talking to an editor. He talks about wind gap and she said there's only uh, uh, money, people from money or trash who, yeah. are, who are from there. And he says, which are you? And she says, um, I'm from money, but I became, I'm trash who comes from money. That's yeah. right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you like it? Love it. Yeah, I love it too. Yeah. I really love it too. And I, I, I particularly love Amy Adams. I think, I've always thought she was excellent. I think she's, yeah. I mean, she's really, she's got a great role here and she's doing it perfectly. Oh yeah, she is the role. There's no, yeah, there's no barriers. She's not, she's putting in so much work, but you don't see her working. Yeah, that's yeah, so right. Yeah. 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 
need to talk about your daughters. One of them is dangerous. The other one's in danger. It's not safe for you here. So, we've watched seven of the eight, and from here on in, we're spoiling. Basically, we're going to speculate on who we think done it. We don't know. Neither of us have read the novel. We're both incredibly good at staying away from, you know, those various spoilers out there in the landscape. So we don't know, so we're not going to ruin it for you. If you've only watched the seven, you can stick around for this bit as we speculate. So what do you think's going on? <laughs> who do you think did it? So I want to clarify something. <laughs> did, we, did we discover the chief's relationship with the mother? No. So we don't know whether... I mean, there's a lot of hints, but it says something because we don't know who her dad is. He's, he's this mystery character, That's whoever true. her dad is. That's true. And then... Oh, my and God, then she he could said, be the chief! I think it is, and she says something uh, about, like, I could never love you because of, who you're, because of your dad or something like that. Because okay, your dad's incapable of love, but the chief seems kind of compassionate. No, no, he... he, he his wife is a slave to him. <laughs> That's true. He lusts after her, but I think, but he, you know, I, 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 yeah. That's yeah. one thing I'm wondering, is the chief her dad? That, I don't know why that's the I key don't think thing the chief me. is her dad. Okay. I don't think we're going to meet her dad. Could be wrong. Um, the chief is the father of some, has to be the father of one of them, because he's always hinted at that she's having an affair. Maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't have to have ended up in a child, but it's... Definitely in the history there. Right. I mean, I think we know that Alan, who's the house husband, we know that he's the father of her. And we haven't right. even got on to her yeah, yet. I, I mean, she, she's Australian, by the way. Oh, really? She is Australian. Right. I, her name escapes me right now, but she is doing an Eli incredible Eliza job. Eliza Scanlon? Eliza Scanlon. Yeah, God, she's good. Yeah. The, and the fact that I've heard her do an interview in her Australian accent, right, and that just makes her performance like quadruple difficulty. She's so intense yeah. as a character. So intense. Playing lots of games, and I actually didn't have sympathy for no. her once. No, I'm until... amazed that Camille is willing to cut her so much throat. I it's know. Like... Well, uh, yeah, so she manipulates everyone around her, except... Yeah. The last episode, I definitely had sympathy for her. Okay, so she's yeah. another victim of this yeah. Munchausen yeah. by proxy that... Because here's the thing, <laughs> there's a whole Munchausen by proxy thing going on that we didn't tell you about before. <laughs> I mean, that's the mind fuck to me. Yeah, that I, is I, so I, dark. I picked it up on it earlier. Oh, yeah. yeah I All the clues are there. Yeah, exactly. You definitely feel like the mum's... I didn't. Ex I didn't actually. When when the nurse talks about how the the previous sister, that's how she died. I actually. It, I didn't expect that. Even though in my subconscious, I knew that that's what was going on the whole time. Does that make sense? Yeah, I totally. Like, I was so shocked. Yeah. How could that be? How could she have done that? Because she plays such a victim that she lost a daughter. And also just because it is such a shocking thing. Oh, it's you know, a like horrible we've, thing. In the course of our viewing lives, we've seen 20,000 murders and we've seen 6,000 rapes, dare I say it, and sexual mm. assaults and everything. But there's the sixth sense and this, you know, Munchausen by proxy is still such a rare thing to be depicted and it is so grotesque mm. as a crime mm. and I think it's just like so even though you and I both picked up that that's what was coming it still shocked us like I did too I picked up I was like oh my god th this is going to have a Munchausen by proxy subplot and yet when it came I was still really grimmed out by it because it is so grim should we clarify Munchausen by proxy well it's basically if I was the mother and Adam was my daughter and I was <laughs> deliberately making him sick so that I would get sympathy and... And I would need you to care for me. And he would need me to care for him. It's a really grim thing. Whereas Munchausen's is just making yourself sick. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. if I just wanted sympathy, I could make myself sick. But I'm Munchausen by proxy is I am proxy making Adam sick so that I can care for him and get this sympathy. So, oh, look at me. I'm, I'm this nurse type and, thing. And what the show does well is once that reveal happens, I don't think we see a distinct change in Patricia. You know how shows, when they finally reveal yeah. that little thing, you see a distinct change now yeah. in, the, in the villain or the antagonist and it's like, oh, yeah. all along. No, she's right. still behaving the same way yeah. and now it's just got this really messed up, yeah, she's so fucked up. Yeah. yeah, she is so <laughs> she's fucked so up. The way up. she talks about it, and you're just like, but you're, will, you're yeah. mixing the potion that you're feeding your daughter, yeah. your healthy young daughter who's yeah. terrified of you, and that yeah. she know, the daughter knows what's happening as well. Yeah, it's the perfect role and perfect casting for her. I mean, oh it's my just gosh, her. it's an intense ride. So who do you think done it? <laughs> we, we, should, we should place our bets. I don't think the brother did it. No. John. No. Um... 
I think, I mean, it, the obvious thing is you think she did it because she's got this really in link. I think she's making her sick and I think the other two girls found out. And, and she, she did it. I think the chief did it. No! You think the chief did it for her? You betcha. Yeah. <laughs> I buy that. That's, that seems logical to me. There's the one character who's been on the periphery that I'm like, oh, he could really have done it, but he could just be a red herring, is the drama teacher who comes to her and says, yeah. look, I'm sorry for gang raping you back in the day. And she was like, don't worry about it. We still got to think, you know, we've got one episode left and that's where I'm, I'm just sad because... <laughs> <laughs> Not enough can happen in one episode, I don't think, for me to... Because I want to still live in this world. Oh, it's too. so I rich. Love it. yeah. I love it. But, um, but it would be very unsatisfying. That would be think true. about it from a construction yeah. You're right. point of view. Yeah. You're right. Your idea that it's the local cop doing it for her, I love because, that. Because... Because the two girls found out that she's poisoning her. I think that's the... That I'm links it all together. Do you know what I find interesting about her um, cutting is that it's the... You know, it's still a TV show or it's still a book. It's still got to be poetic. It's still got to be a little larger than life. So it's not just cutting. Yeah. Her whole body is covered in words that she's carved into herself. Yeah. And, and, and there's a ri there's, there's, it's like tattoos. It's like she's tattooed herself. Yeah. And everything is telling a story. And that's like a comic book character would be, you'd expect someone who cuts in a comic book to have their whole body covered. Take yeah. it to that next level. Yet, because Amy Adams is the brilliant... Uh, actor that she is, she grounds it all. Yeah. She has a body covered in cuts, but she doesn't. She doesn't reveal it, and the, and the filmmakers keep it. They don't. They don't give that away. You yeah. know, it's something we really have to work through, and the character has to work through as we start to discover that. Yeah. Yeah. It's very clever. I can't wait till the end. I like your theory. I'm. I'm. I, I think I'm going to go into the final episode thinking that's what's going to happen. I. I also hope we wrap up a couple of little minor mysteries, such as what exactly the publisher of her newspaper is up to. I mean, I understand that he's dying of cancer. I understand that he's got his own alcohol issues. And is he just trying to save her or is there something darker? I don't know if there's something darker. I think he's positioned and he, his wife's always with him. So that is very much a solid, healthy-minded, right. loving relationship. So we're constantly reminded that out of the swamps, you go to the cities and people are normal. Yeah. <laughs> but, but she... Um, I do, I think that my, an incident must have occurred very recently that has prompted that from him because right. he's, I think he's desperately worried about her and he knows this is the last hope yeah. is to get, to make her focus on her job, but, you know, get her to deal with all these buried issues. We'll find out everything this coming Monday, Australia time, Sunday in the United States. You've been watching Adam and CJ on Watch This. Watch This.